I'm tired. I'm sleepy. I'm beginning to think I'm getting lazy. Although I know better than that. I'm not one that usually gets lazy. I get motivated. I usually work long hours. But you know, there's something true about being in ministry. And one of those things is that the more you give out, the more that you do, the more you really need to replenish yourself. <laughs> you really need to replenish yourself because you're just dragging. <laughs> no, you really need to to be mindful of the fact that you can become exhausted. You could get really tired and that you if you are unprepared and not guarded for those moments when you may be assaulted by the enemy or your own thoughts, your flesh or circumstances or even well-meaning believers that want to come up and somehow, you know, either help you or <laughs> or hinder you. Um, because of your tiredness, you might not be properly trained in knowing how to respond in those moments. The key is, in my weakness, he is made strong. You see, even though right now I'm very, very tired, I know if I keep my focus on him, as I discuss and relate about Jesus, the Holy Spirit seems to revive that spark inside, that <laughs> love and joy. And he seems to give supernatural strength and ability for the moment, at the time that you need it. Now, I'll be honest, once, say, we get done recording this and I go over to post it, <laughs> I'm like the puppet doll, you know, where the guy pulled the strings and it was the puppet and the puppet master let go of the string. And phew, I'm wiped out. So I'm tired. <laughs> I'm really tired. So I went over and I'm making some coffee. You want some? Come on. Let's have some coffee. Oh, you can't join me? Why don't you go get some coffee? Only, don't go to Starbucks. I'll already start teaching by the time you get back. Or I should say, it's not really so much that I'm teaching, but it's kind of like we're both waiting to see what the Holy Spirit might say. Because most of the time, I'm just as surprised about what God has to say as you are. Only, let me take that back. You know what? I'm not just as surprised as you are. I'm more surprised than you are. Why? Well, frankly, because God is using me. So, if God is using me, then he's speaking through me to you. And as he's speaking through me, I'm just as dumbfounded that he would use somebody like me to talk to somebody like you and both of us would get something out of it. Now that really amazes me. But, not only does it amaze me, it should encourage you. You know why? Well, the answer is pretty simple. The reason why you can be encouraged when God can use somebody like me to speak to somebody like you is that if he could use someone like me, we know he could use you. <laughs> I mean, who am I? I'm nobody special. Boy, that's for sure. So, if God would take some Jesus freak gypsy like me and use me, what's stopping you? Nothing, really. I mean, one of the things I've tried to make very clear in all of these videos is that it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Matter of fact, all it takes is you being honest and let God work through you. When you do, you're going to find that you will have that supernatural ability come to you when you don't prepare, but you let God be there. 
I always like to say it that way because when I think about it, it's like one minute I'm dead in the water and I'm just oh, I'm dragging. Then I start talking about Jesus. <laughs> I start talking about the Son of God. And I start wandering in my spirit in the heavenlies. My mind starts going into places that it would not normally think of. And suddenly it's as though God wakes up and I'm alive unto him. I'm quickened, as it were, to his spirit. And then I'm filled with joy over just who he is, really. Just how wonderful God is in me. So then you watch the transformation from kind of a beat up dude, you know, kind of looking kind of scuzzy to, oh, child of God who's willing to be humbled before you with his own failings and fears and forgetfulness or mindfulness and weaknesses, but still sharing with you the oracles of God, as it were, the wisdom of the ages, the literal word of God as it becomes alive in my flesh and speaks outward to you from his spirit so that you would learn from him and not me. And I'm blessed that way because, you know, then I don't have to worry about what I'm going to say. You know, I know there's a lot of, well, pastors and elders and deacons, whoever it's going to teach, they sit down and they got their, their format outlined, you know, notes, integrity of the delineation of coming down through the precepts of making the perspective of the spiritual truth with the explanation, situation, circumstance, personal application, modern transliteration, personification, and identification with the person of the word as well as the people in the crowd and then trying to make some cute story out of it also and make it fit by testimony and you know, don't forget to wrap it up with the gospel. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Not in this camp. You see, where we're camped out is kind of like a fireside next to the Sea of Galilee. And uh, Jesus is sitting there, you know, and he's cooking fish. And he says, come on. You know, and there's no great analogy there. The disciples were out fishing and Jesus is cooking fish for them. There's no great spiritual truth. The reality is it's just a practical experience that they enjoyed with the Son of God, the Son of Man. So when you can relate your personal experience of God with God's people, then you can do just exactly what we do right here on video. We just share what's going on. We don't care who's watching or what's happening. We just do it. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not, for behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord, but thy life will I give unto you for a prey in all places whither thou goest. A promise given for hard places and a promise for safety and life in the midst of tremendous pressure, a life for a prey. It may well adjust itself to our own times, which are growing harder as we near the end of the age and the tribulation period. What is the meaning of a life for a prey? It means a life snatched out of the jaws of the destroyer as David snatched the lamb from the lion. It means not removal from the noise of the battle and the presence of our foes, but it means a table in the midst of our enemies, a shelter from the storm, a fortress amid the foe, a life preserved in the face of continual pressure. Paul's healing when pressed out of measure Paul's healing, when pressed out of measure so that he despaired of life, Paul's divine help when the thorn remained, but the power of Christ rested upon him and the grace of Christ was sufficient. The Lord gave him his life for a prey in the hardest of places, and may it be that the Lord help us in those places for ourselves. You see, your life for a prey simply means that you don't get to decide what's best for you. You were not designed to be, oh, the superstar football player. No, you're just, if God speaks it to you and says it, you know, that your life was meant for prey, if that fits in your life, you were meant to be the offering of God to the people. You would be chewed up, spit upon, spat, 
nailed to a cross, crucified, people are going to hit you, stab you in the back, lie about you, tell all manners of things about you. They're going to, you know, even mistort, contort, misunderstand, confuse, abuse, and really use you because you are meant to be used that way. Because God is going to use that in some way, in some way, to a person that will be touched by you and your reactions to what God is doing, allowing you to go through this as your life for a prey. For when he does that, then, well, you're a lot like Jesus then, aren't you? You become a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Gee, I wonder what exceptional service would be. The scriptures talk about that we are continually being offered as a living sacrifice unto God, that we are always being beaten upon, we are always being persecuted, we are always going to tribulation. But I don't see that necessarily true about everyone in the body of Christ, but there are those who have entered into ministry that understand what that is. Now, sadly, we do have certain kinds of ministries where people are like, well, you know, this is prosperous and they make a lot of money and they only do this within, you know, nine to five and they make so much money per hour and enjoy it and go home. Okay. God bless them from a distance. Maybe up close, too. But for me, I only know what to do that I do, which is to pour out and pour out. And when I'm exhausted, to pour out some more. That when there's aggravations coming at me from the left hand, when there's false doctrine coming at me from the right, when the prosperity doctrine is trying to beat me down, when the health and wealth you got to be healthy, you got to be wealthy, type people are trying to tell me I'm a sinner. When everyone's trying to come at me from all the different directions, I just look at them and say, it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus, it's Jesus in me, Jesus in you, Jesus in us, Jesus, it's all about Jesus, we're going to fight Jesus. They don't know what to do with me. <laughs> they don't know whether we ought to crucify him or lock him up. They don't know whether I'm stupid. Or intelligent. I have no clue whether I have my hermeneutic and my homiletic down and I'm a theological wizard or whether I'm just really kind of dumb, you know, and somebody's feeding me lines. Boy, we got them fooled. But you know the truth. I'm like you. My life has been offered as a prey, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto, unto my God, which is my reasonable service unto him. Because of his sacrifice for me and his love for me daily, I have no greater joy than to share and to care and to be there for those, even if it's just one person, even just for one some person that may not even ever see me or I meet them or see them, but that they might somehow someone else would be influenced in order to touch that one person. It's really not about us. It's about what God is making us to be. We often pray to be delivered from these calamities. We even trust that we shall be. But we do not pray to be made what we should be in the very presence of these calamities, to live amid them as long as they last in the consciousness that we are held and sheltered by the Lord and can therefore remain in the midst of them so long as they continue without any hurt. For 40 days and nights, the Savior was kept in the presence of Satan in the wilderness. And that under circumstances of special trial. His human nature was being weakened by want of food and rest. The furnace was heated seven times more than it was wont to be heated. But the three Hebrew children were kept a season amid its flames as calm and composed as in the presence of the tyrants last applause of torture as they were in the presence of himself before their time of deliverance came. And the lifelong night did not Daniel sit among the lions and when he was taken up out of the den, no matter of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. They dwelt in the presence of the enemy because they dwelt in the presence of God. You know, there's people that want to go with this presence thing and they want to deal with all these weird Holy Spirit things. They want to do these weird goofy things and they want to act like weird. You don't have to do anything. 
You just have to talk to God and walk with Him. You have to be willing to recognize that God didn't say He came to give you a plan that you would prosper and be abundant. He gave you a plan that said you would be His and He would be able to do with you whatsoever He chooses. Not everyone's going to prosper and not everyone's going to have the car and a house and a home and two and a half children or one and a half or three and a half or whatever maybe. You may have those and then lose them and then where did your faith go if that was what it was built upon? Sand. But if your faith is built upon the personal relationship of Jesus Christ that you have in your heart, then no matter what you go through, the reality of knowing that it's specially designed for you, that you could be a Job, that you could be a Daniel, that you could be a Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that you could be even Abraham or Jacob or Isaac, that you could be like Jesus going through the desert. Isn't it worth it? Don't you find comfort in that, knowing that God trusts you so much that you have the honor and the privilege of going through these trials that he's designed specifically for you to become forth like gold, precious jewels and silver? Or are you wood, hay and stubble? And as soon as the fire hits, you're fleeing as fast as you can. God, this devil is attacking me because I'm going through trials and tribulations. It's the devil, it's the devil, it's the devil. Oh God, my health is failing. It's the devil. It's the devil, it's the devil. Oh God, my children are rebelling against me. It's the devil, it's the devil, it's the... What if it's God? What if? What if your life has been offered as a prey? And whithersoever thou goest, your life shall be a prey unto those around you. The answer is simple. If God go with us, we need fear who is before us. So let us go forward with God, irregardless of whether he prospers us or whether he abases us. For whether we live or whether we die, whether he perish or whether we come forth with life. Know ye this, that the living God does according to what he chooses to do, O Nebuchadnezzar. And you have nothing to say about where we go and what we do. For it is God who stands with us. My prayer for you is you would stand with God in the midst of the worst of tribulations and trials that you have of your life, that you would find Jesus just as he promised he would, right there with you, always.